All right. So, how's it, how's it going so far? Good? Woo. All right. So, I'm going to introduce really quickly Dana. Uh, Dana is an MIT student here. She's president of the MIT ASO, and she's helping organize uh, the conference. And she's going to be moderating the session of SciTech Talks. SciTech Talks, she'll explain more, but basically, um, they're just you know short TED presentation, like TED style talks, um, and we're gonna have one fireside chat. That's what these are for. Um, so without further ado, Dana, uh, she'll be moderating and uh, have a good time. Hey everyone. So uh, as Rami said, I'm Dana. I'm the president of the MIT Arab Student Organization. And before we get started with the uh, SciTech talks, I just wanted to talk a little bit about SciTech uh, and the journey we've come on. Uh, so we started the conference last year, um, and it's been an amazing journey working with all these MIT students to make this happen. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that the team put on last year and this year. You know, it's really showing me that there is a potential and future for this conference to go on for many years to come. You know, Rami and Hassan have done a great job uh, being leads for this year. Ghada is the vice president. She started off as a freshman last year, and this year, you know, as a sophomore, she's doing an amazing job, and hopefully she'll get to lead it in the future. Um, so shout out. <laughs> so uh, on the theme of young people doing amazing things, uh, let's look to what happens after Graduation, what are some of the inspiring stories that will get us out um, and doing things that are super impactful? Um, so that's what our tech talks are about. They're about the journey, the vision, um, and the success that's happening. So um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Hanna Salame. He is the founder and design director of Hanna Salame Design. Uh, he's an architect, design, an ar uh, designer, and artist, ranked as one of the top 45 most influential architects in the Middle East uh, by Middle East Architect Magazine. And he'll go into more detail on this when he comes up here. So without further ado, if you could help me welcome Hanna Salame. So, um, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. It's a huge honor to be at such an amazing institution. And I hope that uh, based on the, th the things I heard today and uh, especially things that uh, Mr. Sawais was talking about earlier, that I will serve as an example of someone who has received education from North America and has, it seems, dared to go back, even though in my head doesn't seem that grand, uh, but has gone back. And uh, we are working on a daily basis to try to, uh, and in, to use MIT uh, lingo, hack the system in a very positive way uh, in our own country. And I'm proud to say that uh, we have taken certain steps in that direction, and I do, uh, I do believe that we're quite blessed in Jordan uh, with the leadership that we have. We actually do have a Harvard graduate as a prime minister. So uh, MIT and Harvard, both, uh, Dr. Amar Razaz. Um, and so, Hopefully, I'll be showing you a little bit of what we've been doing and then sharing some good news on that regard uh, in our country. Um, I want you to imagine with me a world uh, in the very near future where maybe we can build bridges, parks, and public spaces for free. And um, I'm not sure how I can click. Uh, is this the clicker? Our cities are defined to a great extent uh, by the public spaces they have to offer, by the buildings, the architecture, the streets uh, that define this visual image that we have of our city. And it goes beyond just the visual image. It really creates uh, the dynamics of the city and it really develops our city in, 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 in a way that allows us to interact with it and, and move around. These, these features, these grand features, um, become the essence of the city, but most often, they become a very big burden uh, on, our, on our budgets uh, to build and to maintain. And in the Middle East, we really see uh, this problem manifesting very, very strongly 
uh, in our cities. And so we started thinking, is there a way for us to, to hack the system and to find ways of solving these problems without expecting our economy to uh, bloom overnight and to change? This building played a very, very big role in me becoming a green architect today. Uh, I visited this building for the first time uh, when I was a teenager. This is called the Qasr al-Kharrani. It's a castle in the eastern desert in Jordan, my home country. And uh, this is a building that's quite fascinating, or at least was very fa quite fascinating for me as, as a kid going to visit it. Because even though the desert was extremely hot, and we're talking about maybe 40 degrees Celsius temperature there, you walk into this building and you feel as if there's air conditioning on in that space. Noting that this is a 1,400 year old building that definitely doesn't have any kind of technology in it. So this really opened our minds and I was thinking if we were able to do this thousands of years ago, then surely we can do a lot more with the technology that we have today and with our capabilities today. So we took this and we started applying this into our own work as an architecture firm in Jordan. And we are currently under construction with Jordan's first net zero energy bill house that completely does not need any energy to run um, after, it's, after it's constructed. And we did this in very similar ways to how the, the castle in the desert uh, works. It's just a matter of understanding nature, connecting with it, and understanding the movement of the sun and the movement of the wind to allow for natural daylighting, natural ventilation, which not only saves energy and saves the environment, but also creates healthier environments for people to live in. And it, it ends up being a much more uh, sustainable model for architecture in general. We also learned to work with nature a lot in the second project that we, that we did, where we came to a site that's full of ancient oak trees, and naturally we did not want to harm a single one of them uh, when we built the house that we were building. And we came up with a solution where we create a house that works with nature instead of against it, intertwines between the trees, and then flies out in the end to get the view that our clients were very desperate for without cutting down a single tree, and by making the trees actually the biggest feature of the house, also coming up with a house that's very energy efficient, that relies on natural ventilation, natural lighting, and all natural elements, which becomes also a healthier living environment for the people within it. In another case of working with nature in a maybe different way, and this is not working anymore, there we go. Um, we, we recently designed a project in South Sudan, and it's a very new uh, country in the city of Juba with very limited resources. And even though we had a 35 million JD, uh, sorry, dollar budget, uh, that's still considered a very small amount uh, compared to the size of the project that we're designing, which was a very massive uh, hospital in the middle of the city. Um, and then we started thinking, how can we work with nature and with the surrounding environment to actually amplify and make use of the situation that we're in? And so we started looking at the, at the native architecture that they have in their cities. And we saw these mud huts, these old mud huts, the, the walls built of mud and the uh, roofs built of straw. And we tried to learn a lot from them. And what we saw is that not only are these local materials that are available there in the country, so that you're not importing anything, you're not paying on uh, extra energy to, to bring them in, but they also act as very uh, important environmentally friendly uh, materials that create shading and insulation. So it reduces the, the need for, uh, for artificial cooling or heating in, in the buildings. And so we took that and we actually built a very exaggerated mud hut. It's a very large building. This actually is a state of the art hospital. The, it would be the most advanced hospital in the country. And yet it resembles a lot uh, from, from the country's old architecture. And please note, this is not a matter of just mimicking a look. It's really a matter of using the actual technologies, as we, as we like to call them. The straw roof extends over the building, creating in insane shading on the building, reducing the amount of cooling needed. It's also a great insulator. And the mud walls also work as very good insulators. So they really work with the environment to allow this very modern building to thrive in a very harsh climate. So with this knowledge and with all of our projects that are always very green, we started thinking, can we take this much further? Is there a way to actually influence uh, bigger projects and not just the, not just the commission projects that we are working on uh, in, in, in the same uh, direction? Um, Amman's two largest uh, incomplete towers are on, on my way to work. And if any of you have been to Amman in the past 10 or 12 years, you've seen these incomplete towers just standing there in the most prominent area in Jordan. And people are very frustrated because they became a symbol of failure uh, that is not moving anywhere. And it, I mean, they, they, they stopped because of the bankruptcy in 2008. So it was a problem of lack of funding uh, in the, in, for a private investment at the time. 
And people, in their, in their head, they had, they had two solutions. Either we demolish these towers, which in my opinion is a disaster because you can't just delete history and pretend like it never happened, um, or continue the original project, which we also, after a lot of research, realized is also another disaster because there, there are many infrastructure problems with the project, and I'm not going to go into detail, but it really shouldn't continue. So we came up with a third solution uh, of converting these towers into money makers because they have to be money makers. Um, and how can we make them positive influences on our city? And our idea was to actually outfit the two towers with solar panels to produce energy from the sun. We get over 300 days of sun in Jordan. We're quite blessed. Uh, so we utilized that. And we actually proposed converting the entire two towers into a vertical farm that uses hydroponic farming that allows it to become a massive uh, vertical farm in the middle of the city producing organic produce for the people. And the model became very profitable, and it's actually uh, a very feasible idea. And we're going to be talking about what happened with it uh, at the end of this talk today. Uh, this uh, idea, we were nobodies, and we didn't know how to get to the right channels. And we knew there's a lot of bureaucracy in our countries. And so the way we did it is that we released it in a video on social media. And luckily for us, that video went extremely viral, and it was very well received. And it actually reached all the important decision makers and uh, that's one way of, as to how we hacked the system and getting the idea across. And we'll talk about, about that in a bit. Uh, and then I'm going to take on a quick trip to London just to show you that these ideas can be applied not just in Jordan. Our second vision video, as we call it, was directed uh, towards London. I was cycling there uh, in the city with a local friend of mine uh, along the River Thames. And as you know, there are many bridges that cross it. The particular area that we were in was lacking a bridge, and apparently the people have been asking for that bridge for over 100 years. And it hasn't been built because of lack of funding. And I was very surprised because we're used to these kinds of problems in our part of the world. But then when you realize that this is actually a quite universal problem, I mean, the, the, the strain that we have on our environment, on our, on our countries, on our budgets are quite universal. So we set out a plan to design a bridge that would be built and maintained for free without costing the city a single penny. And that was our biggest target. And the way we did that is we started thinking, OK, um, the arrow shifted somehow, but it's OK. Um, what, we're, what we keep doing is that we keep looking at ways of funding our project in what I believe are non-renewable sources. And we keep relying on people paying taxes, which is very heavy on people. And so we started thinking, OK, if we're looking at renewable incomes to cover our costs, then why not look at renewable resources? And that's where our knowledge in green design and sustainability came into play, where we try to take uh, the bridges requirement for a cycling and pedestrian path, but add more elements into it that would allow it to, to become a moneymaker, to cover its own cost and cover its own investment without needing a continuous injection from the, the government. And so one example, we noticed that there's going to be 1.2 million people crossing that bridge every year. We tiled the entire pedestrian path with these tiles that produce energy from people walking on them. Uh, on another energy note, the biggest, uh, the biggest element of nature passing under the bridge is the water. So we suggested adding uh, uh, animal-friendly water turbines under the bridge to produce water, uh, electricity from the water that can then be sold to the grid, producing a very significant revenue. And along that, we came up with a lot of other ideas like wind farming, solar farming, and many different ideas that convert uh, energy into money for the project. Uh, we also suggested turning the bridge into an outdoor public uh, park. I, I really believe that we always have to think uh, inclusively and not just in isolation. Uh, a bridge doesn't have to be only a bridge. It can be much more than that. And so the idea of converting it into a park was very important. In that park, we outfitted it with outdoor workout areas that have gym equipment that actually produce energy from people exercising. So what we're doing is that we're allowing people to exercise for free, which is very good for your health as well. But they're also helping us produce energy, which is also to the grid and uh, allowing the bridge to make money. Uh, we then thought of adding direct money makers, such as these booths that can be rented out to, to people in, the, in, in London uh, who can use them to sell coffee or food or souvenirs or whatever they want to do on the bridge. They're paying us rent and activating the bridge into becoming a really fun space as well uh, in there. Um, the bridge also uh, is now named the Diamond Jubilee Bridge uh, to commemorate Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's 60 years, 60 years of ruling the country. So we suggested 
turning these, uh, this outdoor bridge into an outdoor museum that has these screens that could pay tribute to Her Majesty. And between those exhibition spaces, we can place advertising that also brings revenue to the bridge. So we had a lot of um, uh, thoughts towards revenue generation in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the bridge. And we designed the shape of the bridge to be an iconic landmark that would be befitting of a city like London. And of course, uh, we propose naming it the Diamond Jubilee Crown, since it is dedicated to Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and as you can see, maybe the shape of the bridge is specific to London in this particular case, but the ideas behind it can be quite universal. So what we're trying to promote here is a new way of thinking of how we can build these, uh, these public structures that are very heavy uh, in cost on any city in the world, even if it's a rich uh, country. And let's try to think of ways of using that, uh, that uh, knowledge to really um, build our cities in a more uh, human and, and uh, thoughtful and mindful, uh, mindful way. So we talked about generating uh, enough money to cover the running cost of the bridge, to cover the, the, the initial cost of the bridge, which is a very significant amount as well. We realized that not only are uh, our gener revenue generation ideas generating enough money to cover the cost of the bridge, but they also uh, create a profit. And when you say the word profit, we attract capitalists like Mr. Uh, Sawaris earlier to come in and pitch into that. And that means that we actually we would invite, let's say in this particular case, for them to cover 50% of the cost of the bridge. And we had the idea of inviting people just like you and me to donate uh, to build this bridge where everyone donating would get their name carved on this monument forever. Um, and this becomes an emotional aspect of it. And what happens in the return is that we give the ownership of the second half of the bridge to the city itself, which means that they would get half of the profit of that bridge which means that instead of London having to pay for the bridge and to pay for the maintenance of the bridge, they now actually make profit from that bridge and it, it becomes a very productive uh, asset uh, in the city. And as you can see in the, in the, in the video here, it, it still serves the function of, of a pedestrian bridge and there are cycling uh, paths on the side, but it really becomes an active urban space that's not only a, a more fun space and beneficial for the people, but also a money generator for the city and, and something that's more sustainable. Um, we then went back to our beloved city, Amman, and we tried to build even further on this idea. These vision videos became a tradition in our, in our company. We have our eyes out towards our city and towards our country and towards the world, really, because we live in a, in a, in a universal village now. And um, we, tried, we try now to look at problems that, would, that we call old problems and that would affect at least a million people, just like the bridge did and just like the towers did. In this particular case, we were looking at our city and we noticed there's a major lack in public parks and in in, in public spaces in general in our city. And I think this is a problem that a lot of cities in the Middle East also face. Um, but we tried to look at why does that happen and we realized that obviously the reason why we can't build parks because parks cost a lot to build and to maintain. And um, even though we believe that parks are a necessity for a living, they are being treated as luxuries in our countries mainly because of the lack of budgets, because other things are now get, gaining precedent over this particular issue. So instead of sin, sitting around and saying, okay, let's just wait until our economy gets better, we started thinking, how can we, in the same economic situation, find a solution to this problem? And so we try to think of ways to actually build parks for free and have them maintain themselves for free. And this is basically exactly what we're about to show you. Um, the, both the first two ideas were released in videos, and I'm going to show you this actual video itself now uh, on the screen. <laughs> أمان صار وقت نحكي بالموضوع قلة الحدائق والمتزاهات العامة بمدينتنا مشكلة كبيرة وصار لازم نحلها أنا اسمي حنا سلامة وبمثل فريق مهندسين معماريين بهذا الفيديو الحدائق من أساسيات الحياة وأثبت أنها بتخفف التوتر وبتحسن الصحة وبتشيل الكشرة طبعا إحنا عارفين أن الوضع الاقتصادي الحالي ما بس نحن نبني حدائق جديدة ففكرنا كيف نقدر إحنا كمعماريين محليين بهتموا بالبيئة أن نغير هذا الواقع حطينا هدف نصمم حديقة بتمول حالها لحالها نقدر نبنيها ونشغلها بدون ما نكلف الشعب أو الحكومة ولا قرش واحد وزيادة على هيك بدنا إياها كمان تدعم المجتمعات المحلية المحيطة فيها خلوني أفرجيكم كيف 
أول وأكبر تحدي بواجهنا هو أن نلاقي الأرض بدنا تكون الحديقة بوسط المدينة لتكون قريبة من الناس بس ما بدنا ندخل بقصص الاستملاكات لفت انتباهنا المهندس المعماري عمار خماش للفرصة المميزة الموجودة في خط سكة حديد الحجاز لتنفيذ هذا المشروع خط الحجاز معلم تاريخي أنشأه العثمانيين أوائل القرن العشرين لنقل الحجاج لمكة المكرمة ومر بقلب عمان بشكل طولي من شمالها لجنوبها وحالياً يستخدم لأغراض سياحية فقط مع العلم أن وضع الخط ودخان وضجيج وخطورة القطار عم تزعج أهالي المناطق السكنية والتجارية الكتيرية اللي بمر فيها الحلو بالموضوع أن أرض السكة ملك وزارة الأوقاف وهذا بيعني أنه ما في حاجة لاستملاكها من الناس ولأنها وقف ما رح تصير برسم البيع أبداً عشان هيك بنقترح نسوي شغلتين بهاي الارض اولا نحولها لمنتزه عام وثانيا نحيي فيها خط القطار بطريقه بتناسب مدينتنا خلونا نبدا تشغل السكه ارض عرضها 30 متر وطولها بالمناطق المأهوله بعمان 26 كيلو يعني مساحه اجماليه بتبلغ 780 دونم عم نحكي عن تقريبا ثلاث اضعاف مساحه حدائق الحسين اول شيء بدنا نعمله هو انه نزرع شجر على طول الخط وبما انه الاردن ثاني افقر دوله بالعالم بالموارد المائيه، لازم نختار نباتات واشجار ما بدها ري كثير مثل السنوبر او الخروب. ثاني شيء، لاحظنا انه عدد كبير من الناس بيستخدم السكه الحاليه كممر مشاء امن ليوصل لمدارسهم واشغالهم. عشان هيك بنقترح انشاء رصيف متواصل ليقدروا الناس يمشوا عليه. ولانه القطار الحالي خطر، بدنا نبدله بالقطارات الخفيفه او الترام بالانجليزي. وابحاثنا بينت انها بامكانها تشتغل على نفس السكه القديمه. بمدن كثيره في العالم، الترام يستخدم للنقل العام جوا المدينه. وهو كثير امن من وجود قطار تقليدي بعبر هاي المناطق الحساسه لانه عنده القدره انه يمشي ببطء ويوقف بسرعه. والترام رفيق بالبيئه لانه بيشتغل على الكهرباء فما بيطلع دخان وبكون هادي نسبيا. بتعتبر كل وحده من هدول المركبات بديل ل 40 سياره على الشارع. واذا بنحط عده محطات ترام على الخط بدنا نساهم بتخفيف ازمه السير بعمان. وطبعا مش رح يكون هذا نظام مستقل. خط الترام الممتد من الرصيفه للمطار رح يشبك مع كل خطوط الباصات العامه اللي بتتقاطع معه. والاهم انه بمرق من جنب مركز النقل الجديد اللي رح تنشئه الامانه في عين غزال ليشبك عمان مع الزرع. هيك بنكون تخلصنا من مشاكل القطار القديم بس ما قتلنا سكه حديد الحجاز، بالعكس بنكون جددناه وطورناه ليلائم عصرنا. وبنساعد فكره احياء الخط كله بالمستقبل يلي ممكن يتضمن قطار سريع بشبك المطار بالعقبه. هلا بما انه صار عندنا شجر ممر، صاروا الناس يقدروا يوصلوا لكل اجزاء الارض، وبنقدر نحط مقاعد يقعدوا عليها تحت الظل. واكيد في مناطق مخصصه للتنزه. يعني الهش والنش رح تتضمن الحديقة كمان مناطق لعب محمية للأطفال فيها سحاسيل ومرجيح وغيرها من الألعاب زي ما حكينا بالبداية أهم هدف عنا أن نخلي حديقة تغطي تكاليفها لحالها بدون مساعدات خارجية عشان هيك بدنا نحولها لمنطقة حيوية فيها أضافات بتجيب مصاري وبتضيف معالم مفيدة للحديقة أول فكرة هي استخدام مباني غير دائمة مثل مقصورات القطار القديمة بتتأجر لشركات كبيرة مثل بنوك أو شركات اتصالات أو كافيهات ومطاعم. هاي الأجارات مش بس رح تولد دخل كبير للحديقة، رح تخلق كمان فرص عمل للمجتمعات المجاورة. بهمنا يكون في عامل تعليمي زي مكتبة عامة أو مركز تعليم إلكتروني تابع لمبادرة إدراك اللي بتيح للناس القدرة على الوصول لمحتواهم على الإنترنت مجاني. كمان رح يكون في اكشاك صغيره مخصصه ليقدروا افراد المجتمعات المحليه يفتحوا فيها شغل خاص الهم مثل دكانه او قهوه او بيع مشغلات يدويه بتجيب لهم دخل مباشر مقابل مبلغ تاجير رمزي بندفع للحديقة بنفس الطريقه اجزاء معينه من الحديقه ممكن تتاجر كاراضي زراعيه لاهالي المنطقه اللي يزرعوها وبنخلق سوق خط الحجاز اللي ممكن يكون تقليد جديد لعرض وبيع منتجات المزارعين للزوار من الاحياء المجاوره او من اي مكان بعمان زي ما بتعرفوا كل حديقة بتحتاج لإنارة بالليل بدل ما نستخدم أعملة الإنارة التقليدية صممنا عميد متعددة الاستخدامات عليها وحدات الإنارة وسلات الزبالة وكاميرات المراقبة والأهم من هاد بتحمل لوحات إعلانية من أجر نصها لتجيب عائد كبير للحديقة والنص الثاني بنحوله لمعرض خارجي لنستعرض تاريخ وإرث خاص سكة الحجاز وتاريخ الأردن على طول الخط ليصير أكبر متحف المملكة وبما انه الاردن متمتع باكثر من 300 يوم مشمس في السنه، حطينا على الجزء العلوي خلايا شمسيه بتحول اشعه الشمس لطاقه كهربائيه بتغطي استهلاك الكهرباء للحديقه كلها. وبتنتج فائض ضخم ممكن ينباع لشركه الكهرباء بعود بدخل كبير للحديقه كمان. بنشوف هون كيف بتقاطع خط الحجاز مع شوارع عديده. هاي التقاطعات هي مداخل الحديقه اللي بنقدر كمان نحط فيها مواقف باصات بتوصل الناس اما لزياره الحديقه او ليشبكوا مع خط الترام. 
وبما انه في تطبيقات مثل اوبر عم تشبك خدمتها مع وسائل النقل العام ممكن يصير في محطات توصيل خاصه باوبر بتوصل الناس برضه اما لزياره الحديقه او ليشبكوا مع الترام او الباص فبتكون هاي الخدمه ساهمت بتخفيف ازمه السير بعمان وبتخفف احتياجاتنا لعدد المواقف اللازمه بالحديقه ومع هيك رح نامن مواقف للسيارات باجره رمزيه اللي برضه بتزيد دخل المشروع طبعا هاي الحديقه بتقدر تتحمل اضافات كثيره مثل ملاعب كره قدم وسله ليلعبوا فيها اهالي المناطق وبقدر كمان يكون فيها مناطق مخصصه لاجهزه رياضيه خارجيه متاحه للناس مجانا اللي بتولد طاقه عن طريق استخدامها وممكن شي يوم يصير عندنا ماراثون خط الحجاز وغيرها من الفعاليات واكيد مهم وجود اماكن مخصصه لنشاطات ثقافيه مثل الموسيقى او الفنون الشعبيه هاي الحديقة بسبب إقامة المهرجانات والاحتفالات مثل عيد الاستقلال والمناسبات الوطنية وشهر رمضان المبارك والأعياد وهيك بتصير الحديقة معلم سياحي أساسي في عمان لأهل المدينة والزوار هلأ بما أنه ميتنا بالأردن قليلة وبما أنه بيوت الناس قريبة نقترح وصل مغاسل المطابخ بموسيرة تنباع المي المستخدمة للحديقة بنسقي فيها شجر الكبير اللي بتحمل المي بالصابون هيك بطلعوا الجيران شوية مصاري وبنخفف هدر المي. طبعا من اهم الاشياء هي كمية فرص العمل رح توفرها الحديقة. بتقديرنا عم نخلق حوالي 2000 وظيفة تندرج تحت المحلات اللي رح تفتح فيه بالاضافة لموظفين الادارة والامن والتنظيف والصيانة والزراعة. لنضمن اسدامة المشروع بنقترح تعيين لجنة مخصصة للحديقة. إما بتعينها الحكومة أو منظمة غير ربحية محلية اللي بتدير شؤون مشروع موظفين كل الأفكار اللي سبق وحكيناها بتفرج كيف نقدر نولد دخل كافي لنغطي الكلفة التشغيلية للحديقة خلونا هلأ نحكي كيف نقدر نغطي كلفة إنشاء المشروع من أساسه بعناصر الكتيرة أولاً أكثر التحديات المكلفة هي الأرض وبحالتنا إذا تعاوننا مع وزارة الأوقاف نختصر كلفة الأرض كاملة ثانياً قطار الترام مكلف جداً بس ما انه السكه موجوده اصلا بنختصر جزء كبير من كلفته ومثل ما عملنا بالمطار بنقدر نخصخص الترام وبنخلص من كلفته كلها رح يتم تمويل الخلايا الشمسيه عن طريق شركات خاصه بتستفيد من الكهرباء المولده لتغطي فواتيرها راحت اذا تعاوننا مع وزاره الزراعه بنقدر نامن ال 5000 شجره رح نزرعها على طول الخط بكلفه مخفضه جدا وعلى سيره التعاون بنقدر احنا كمجتمع نزرع شجر بايدينا انا وزملائي بالمكتب رح نكون من اول متطوعين وهيك بنكون بنينا انتماء للحديقة وخففنا كلفة الزراعة لنغطي باقي الكلفة رح ندعو المؤسسات المحلية لتدعم مقاطع مختلفة من الحديقة كجزء من مسؤوليتهم الاجتماعية وبالمقابل بتسمى هذا المقطع باسمهم وبتلونوا الأعمدة بألوانهم وهيك تنزل كلفة الحديقة للصفر يعني لا رح نكلف الحكومة ولا الشعب ولا قرش واحد والخبر الحلو انه تواصلنا مع أكبر البنوك وشركات الاتصالات والمنظمات غير حكومية وأبدوا حماسهم ليدعموا هاي الحديقة يعني احنا ممكن نمول هذا المشروع راسا، وهذا بيعني انه الحديقة ممكن تتنفذ على مراحل، وتضل تكبر تدريجيا كل ما زاد الدعم. هذا الحل رح يتيح ل 200 ألف شخص انهم يزوروا الحديقة بأقل من ربع ساعة مشي، ومليون و200 ألف شخص بوصلوا لها بالسيارة بأقل من ربع ساعة. مظبوط، عم نحكي عن ثلث سكان عمان. وهينا حليناها، حديقة عامة بتمول حالها لحالها وبصير شريان أخضر بعبر المدينة وبأثر بحياة كثير من الناس. تصميمنا هاد هو بداية الفكرة إذا أخذنا موافقة المباشرة بدنا نجري ورشات عمل مع أهالي المناطق المجاورة لنسمع منهم شو مشاكلهم وأولوياتهم ويشاركونا بأفكارهم ليكون تصميم من الشعب للشعب زي ما شايفين بالتعاون بنحقق أشياء كثيرة خلونا نتعاون نفكر بطريقة مختلفة لنحل مشاكلنا خلونا نتعاون ونزيد على تاريخنا مع لم نفتخر فيه هلا وبالمستقبل خلونا نتعاون ونخلق رؤية جديدة لعمان بتصير رمز للنجاح والتطور على مستوى العالم سمعونا رأيكم وصوتوا باللينك الموجود تحت وشاركونا الحوار على ويب سايت وفيسبوك وإنستغرام باستخدام الهاشتاج حديقة خط الحجاز أو حجاز ريلوي بارك وشكرا Thank you um, So as you can see we're going to get to questions in a bit How much time do I have left? Five minutes? Um, so what we try to do is to really try to promote the idea of collaboration in our city. So many factors came into play in this, uh, whether it's uh, the idea of funding or transportation or many different other elements and all the different ministries need to come into play. And we even collaborated with Uber to produce this video to actually promote the idea of them even being able to collaborate uh, with the public transport uh, system in there. Um, 
I'm going to share some good news with you. The, the three videos have gone very, very, uh, have been very, very well received in, in Jordan and in London. Uh, we, we released the video for the towers literally three years and a day ago uh, for the first two towers. And tomorrow, three years ago, we would have received half a billion dollars in investments ready for the idea that we were talking about. And we're currently in talks with the government on actually making it happen. We had a bit of a delay, but we have some good news coming hopefully very soon. Um, the video in London also was very well received. We received an email from the mayor of London, Mr. Sadiq Khan, and he instructed us exactly on how we can proceed and get planning approval for that bridge. And the most exciting news is pertaining to this video that we just saw, which was only released a month ago in Amman. And I'm so proud of my country for the kind of response that we received, both from the people and the government and the different, uh, uh, whether they're NGOs or private corporations. Uh, we are in very serious talks with the government now uh, to actually make it happen. Everyone is interested in funding it. All the major banks, major telecom com companies are all ready to put the money down. Uh, we do have a meeting, uh, a second meeting with the Prime Minister once I get back to Amman uh, next week in real talks about making this park happen. Every single in ministry has contacted us expressing their interest in adopting it and making it happen. Uh, the royal family is on board. Really, it's, it's been really, really so beautiful. And I think you're the first to know here because we've kept the media in the dark on this, but we are going through the park and it seems like it will be happening uh, very soon. And, yeah. Thank you. What I want to conclude with here is um, uh, going back to the MIT lingo of hacking in a very positive uh, sense. And I loved learning this. Uh, I mean, I've, we've always known the word hacking, but seeing it in a positive way was beautiful for me over the past two days. And what, what I believe we've done here is hacking Jordan twice. Uh, first of all, um, we, we hacked the system in, in trying to think of alternative ways of solving our problems. The lack of public parks is a very old problem, it's not a new one. And uh, if, we kept, if we kept thinking in the old way, then it would have resulted in the same old disasters. So we tried to hack the system by thinking of alternative methods. Uh, I'm done. And the second hack is the way we got to approach the, the, the sharing of the, of the idea and the news. Uh, I don't believe in a million years had we gotten anywhere, had we not d done this on, on social media and had these videos not gone viral, because the videos themselves reached the right people and they contacted us back. I think if we had tried to knock on anyone's doors, then it would have probably not gotten us anywhere. And so what I'm trying to promote here is use technology and use social media and this beautiful world that we live in uh, in a way that could actually benefit you and maybe hack a system that wouldn't have helped you otherwise. Thank you so much for having me and it's been a real honor. Uh, I'm not sure if we have time for questions.